In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. If there was a soundtrack for chapters one through three of the book of Zephaniah, it would be hammering timpanies sounding forth discordant notes of doom. By the time we are at the end of the book, we have an expectation of what is going to happen. We heard of the coming judgment of Judah. That was first in chapter 1. Then we heard God's prophecy of judgment on the nations all around Judah. From the east, excuse me, from the west to the east, from the south then to the uh, north, all the four nations surrounding Judah had their judgment prophesied. Finally, last week, we heard God's speech of judgment unfold on Jerusalem. As the last verses of the book are read tonight, you might wince as you are sure of what is coming. A slaughter scene, surely. Death all around. The end of the world. The final judgment. Then only God, the only righteous one remaining. If books and movies are divided up into comedies and tragedies as to how they end, you got this one. And yet, if you have fought this or judged this to be the case, you find yourself this evening totally wrong. From the rubble of judgment, we see a restored and repentant people emerging, both in Judah and in the surrounding world. They are returning, walking back to God. It seems unthinkable, impossible for what these nations and peoples have been known for, have been described as. And yet the message at the end is one of surprising hope, and yes, even joy. There are no timpanies after all, but shouts of praise. God is singing for his people and rejoicing over them, and a joyous people are singing too. If there is a message tonight, it is summarized by this theme. Judgment is not the end of a chapter, but the beginning of a new book. Judgment is God's work of restoration and new life. How can complete annihilation, as was prophesied and predicted in the last chapters lead to a remnant of people returning? Isn't this contrary to the understanding of annihilation itself? So conflicting are these passages that mistrusting scholars have resorted to thinking that some later editor just merely tacked on the verses we read tonight onto the end of the book. Yet we know better as we see the scriptures as God's word. But we also understand the dilemma as it challenges us also. How can any people come back from the judgment that was described? Yet God's ways are like this. His judgment is total. The end is severe. And yet hope and resurrection come forth even from death. We know different. Out of the dust, God can create a people even as from the darkness he brought forth by his word, light. And so in the passage before us tonight, we see four surprising changes that take place in God's people to cause them to return to him. The first thing we heard is that God changed or would change the speech of the peoples. They who had spoken only falsely about God would speak truly about him and call on his name and not the name of any other idol. They would accept the verdict of judgment against them and turn to God in faith. God would work repentance, and he would do this through a change in speech, their change, but also his speech to them. He would do this and work this in them through the preaching of his law and his gospel, his judgment on the nations was given, but his love was shown to them in the sending of his son. 
Preachers and pastors would be sent out to all the nations, and in these preachers God would reveal to the world what was deserved. He'd offer his forgiveness to all. God changes hearts and speech by making men see what he has done. It shows also what he has done to save them. If God was only wrath, we would run from him. Yet God shows his love that we might run toward him in our sin. God gave the law and the gospel, and to the world he gave his son. God changed our speech, man's speech, into a pure speech enlightened by his word. The second thing we see is that people come from afar. They stream in. Now, we can imagine possibly God's people, the Jews, returning. But even greater is this news that even in the future, the Gentiles would be changed. God's prodigal children of the world come home and back to God. And yet we do see this at Christmas. Jewish shepherds come bending the knee, and the proud nations also come to give their reverence. Zephaniah speaks about the conversion of Jews and Gentiles by the preaching of the gospel. We see this in the worship and adoration of the shepherds and also the Magi. The third thing we see that is described is that God makes the chosen a holy group. They're holy. He removes all that is bad and all that offends in them. He removes specifically the proud. It is his work. But herein we see who is left that he chooses as his own people. Who is it that becomes his treasured and holy people? They are described as the lowly poor. Those are the ones that are left. God's new nation and people are a group of beggars who come having nothing. And we see a picture of this also of this also in the time of Jesus. Poor shepherds are welcomed, and they receive the news of a Christ who is born even for them, while the proud leaders in Jerusalem are scattered in fear and receive only God's judgment. The final thing we see and that Zephaniah describes is that God's promises after the time of judgment is a renewed righteousness among God's people. The characteristics that God is known by are now used to describe the people, simply the people. They become like their God. This is a drastic change if you were paying attention to how they were described before. And Zephaniah says they lie down like sheep and they live in peace. In all of this, you are to see that God's acts of darkness are his points of new beginning. It is not judgment that is a sign of the end, but judgment that is a sign of a new start. These major acts of judgment took place when God's people were sent to the nations. We know that Zephaniah prophesied that they would lose many things in an exile to Babylon they would, but therein and in those places though they had lost home and temple and possessions, God created a new people. He prepared them to return, and he also prepared them for the sending of his son. His son came, and through his son's work, he sent out preachers to speak God's word of judgment and salvation to the nations before the end of time would come. And the law is preached to you, and God's law smatters your heart and condemns you Your conscience is active by the work of God's word. You are shown so often in your life, maybe every day and every minute, so often to be what you do not wish to be, what God's word declares that you should be. His law is like a perfect ruler, and you stand wanting. And it may seem that this is bad and harmful you, some alien and foreign thing, that you are not what you wish, But judgment you should see in the book of Zephaniah is merely God's surgery to purge you from all that is evil and to make you humble and to make you love what is good. God makes a new people, and he forms in them through his word and sacrament so that they become like him.
All this judgment is not a sign of your end or of his end for you or of his spurning you. It is a sign of your renewal. It is a sign of your ever being with him. He does not withhold his wrath and anger at you. He does not withhold his wrath and anger at the world or the church. He speaks the truth. But he does so to purify you, to humble you, and to teach you that you have no sufficiency of your own. You are one who comes to him, having nothing to offer, only life to receive. God's judgment led to a new people, a people like you, trusting and living according to the Lord's voice. And so as we celebrate Christmas this week and see the shepherds and the magi streaming to the manger, us going there as well, we close with the final words of this book, God's final promise as fulfilled in the manger. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. And so the soundtrack of Zephaniah ends. There are surprisingly no timpani at all. The angels sing, for Christ our Savior is born. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.